I believe that historical literacy is about citizenship. We cannot, you cannot be a citizen in a democracy without knowing our history. And especially in an election year, when every day there are new headlines, there are new stories, every one of those stories has a background and a, a, a history behind it. And so historical literacy was important to me as I, as I started to select the sites and write about the background of, of many of these places. Historical literacy is not memorization. It doesn't mean that we need to know when the War of 1812 took place. Um, it, means, it means understanding the historical context and the historical uh, connections between these places and the times in which they became historically significant. And it also, these places are, are resources for understanding our own times. Thank you, thank you all very much. And aren't we lucky, really, to have this beautiful day that's been our, for our enjoyment today and to gather in this marvelous space, so beautifully preserved, going all the way back to the early part of the 18th century with so much history and so much story that we all need to, to take heart from and learn from. I feel very strongly that history is a subject that we cannot overemphasize in raising our children, our grandchildren, and enlarging our own understanding and appreciation of the world we live in, not to say the country we live in. And everything that we can do to encourage history, to keep history vital and part of the liberal arts education in our colleges and universities, the better off we will be in the long run. Right now, nearly 80% of the colleges and universities in the country are no longer requiring any history whatever in order to graduate. And this is a big mistake. It's a big swerve in the wrong direction, in my view. History should not ever be boring. History is not about statistics and dull uh, provisos of rare uh, in, in, and long forgotten testimonials. It's about people. It's about human beings. History is human when in the course of human events. And in order to understand what happened and why it happened, we need to understand those human beings. And one of the most important and best of all ways to understand individual human beings is to go where things happened and particularly go to where they grew up. So if we go to the birthplace of our presidents or people of exceptional ability or achievement, we come to know them in a way that you can no, not know them in any other fashion. I know, for example, that in my work on Harry Truman, John Adams, Theodore Roosevelt, to go to the place where they grew up, to go to the place where they lived, to go to the place where events of major importance in their lives happened. Orville, Wilbur Wright was once asked after he had become known the world over for his achievement with his brother in aviation, he said, do you have a secret of success that you're willing to share with the rest of us? He said, yes, pick out a good mother and father and grow up in Ohio. <laughs> so I spent a very great deal of my time in working on my recent book in Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio, to be specific, just as I spent a great deal of time in Independence, Missouri, and the more time I spent in Independence, Missouri and Dayton, the better I understood Harry Truman and the Wright brothers. My own story is that I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and because Pittsburgh is so replete with history, history of a very different kind, to be sure, than the city of Boston, but it's everywhere around you. And I can remember vividly hearing stories at the dinner table at night told by my father or mother or grandmother about the family background, about the fires and the floods and the strikes and the depression and all of that, and finding it absorbing to a degree that nothing else was. And they didn't burden what they were talking about with a lot of dull dates and 
in statistics, and I think sometimes in the good old Scotch-Irish tradition, they felt that if a story is worth telling, it's worth exaggerating. So, um, and I couldn't get enough of it. The first historic site I was ever taken to was Fort Necessity, which as some of you know, is the first big failure uh, in the story of George Washington, 1754, when he was leading an army of a group of about 300 soldiers, British soldiers, and this was the beginning of the French and Indian Wars, where the French and Indian War began. And we went out, I was probably seven years old, maybe eight years old, and it's not much in the way of a, of a uh, historic monument, it's just a recreation of what was a very small wooden fort put up uh, in, in an emergency of necessity. And um, yet it made an impression on me that I've never forgotten. In my junior year at uh, high school, a friend of mine and his mother and father were gonna go on a historic tour during spring vacation. And he invited me to come along. And I'd never really been out of Pittsburgh. And we went to Charlottesville and saw Monticello and the University of Virginia. And we went on to Washington. And we could double back and came through Gettysburg. And that venture, that expedition, without any question, changed my life. It's what, it's what got me hooked on history and the story of what happened at those places. And it, we've done it, I, my wife and I, have, Rosalie and I, have done it with our own children and with our grandchildren. Take them to these places and it will have an effect that no other experience can provide. Which is why I think that Brent Glass's new book is so very important and very valuable. Now, Brent and I have known each other a long time. Brent was the head of a historic commission in Pennsylvania at Harrisburg, and I, we both think, we both believe we first met in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And I have been delighted to have such a friend ever since. And of course, once he became the head of the Smithsonian's uh, Museum of American History, I took even more interest in that great institution and saw the wonderful progress he made during his time there. This new book of his is like no other book available. There isn't anything comparable. And it, it is exactly what one needs to get there to where these events took place or where these people had their lives shaped or shape our lives by what happened there. And so I, I feel very proud to have been asked by Brent to write an introduction for the book. This is, um, this is the kind of book that can literally change lives. And it can change lives not just for young people, but for all of us, to go to these places we've never been and make a point to understand what happened there and to encourage other people to do the same. So it's with great pleasure that I would like to introduce my friend Brent Glass, scholar, um, believer in the importance of history, and a man who understands exactly the importance of place, not just in the story of our country, but in the story of all of us. So here, here he is, and I hope you give him a good Boston welcome, Brent Glass. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, and David, thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. I, I guess I should say I'm not, uh, I'm not intimidated by following David McCullough. <laughs> and the reason for that is that no one can follow David McCullough. And so I will just uh, say that it's a great uh, honor that you um, uh, provided the forward to, uh, to my book. And I encourage all of you to read the wonderful reminiscences and the wonderful insights that David brings to this, this uh, subject of the power of historic places. Um, something about David you may not know, um, that he has a bridge in Pittsburgh named for him. The 16th Street Bridge uh, was named for David McCullough, and I was privileged to be at that ceremony 
And the only advice I gave David was that if there's a traffic jam on the bridge, please ask the radio stations to say it's the 16th Street Bridge and not, the David, not say there's traffic on the David McCullough Bridge. I don't, uh, I don't think that would, sound, uh, that would sound very good. I also want to thank Emily Curran and the Old South Meeting House for providing this wonderful, beautiful venue for this evening's program. And it's a great honor to speak here. Uh, thanks to all the, the sponsors and co-sponsors. I won't name all of them again because um, you've heard them, but I've been working with um, Old South Meeting House, with uh, the Freedom Trail Foundation, with Old uh, State House, Bostonian Society, the USS Constitution Museum. Uh, they, these are real treasures here in, in Boston, and I'm uh, delighted that I'm able to, uh, to work with them uh, in, in recent years. I also want to recognize uh, an old friend, a good friend, I shouldn't say old friend, uh, Carl Knoll, who, who directs the uh, Historic New England and does an extraordinary job in historic preservation and museums. And Carl and I have uh, known each other as long as David and I have known each other. So, uh, uh, Carl, it's great to see you here. I want to recognize and thank my wife, Catherine Keller, who is here and who has been a great uh, source of inspiration and a wonderful editor of many of the essays that you will read in 50 Great uh, American Places. So thank you, Catherine. Um, I don't take uh, honors for granted. Um, and it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be introduced by David McCullough. And I, when I'm in a program like this, in an uh, atmosphere like this, I think about the first time, one of the first times, I was invited to speak um, to a county historical society in North Carolina, where I started my career. And after the program, the society gave me a lifetime membership in the society, a lifetime membership. And at that age, when I was at that age, that was really worth something to me. <laughs> so uh, about, a year, about a year later, I received a letter from the society that said, uh, your lifetime membership has expired. <laughs> so I um, realized that these honors come and then the, sometimes these honors can go. So I am very honored to be here and I don't take it for granted. And I, when I decided to write this book, David advised me, and it was good advice, to write the book that I would want to read. And the book that I wanted to read, I had three goals in mind. First, I wanted to encourage historical literacy. And David, I think, eloquently is a spokesman for historical literacy, but I believe that historical literacy is about citizenship. We cannot, you cannot be a citizen in a democracy without knowing our history. And especially in an election year, when every day there are new headlines, there are new stories, every one of those stories has a background and a, a, a history behind it. And so historical literacy was important to me as I, as I started to select the sites and write about the background of, of many of these places. Historical literacy is not memorization. It doesn't mean that we need to know when the War of 1812 took place. Um, it, means, it means understanding the historical context and the historical uh, connections between these places and the times in which they became historically significant. And it also, these places are, are resources for understanding our own times. So historical literacy was very important to me. And, and not only are we in a, uh, an election year, a uh, presidential election year, but we're in the year of Alexander Hamilton. And what's been so great for me is to see the uh, national and international interest in the founders of, Ameri of, of, of our country uh, through the popularity of Alexander Hamilton. And um, I was in Monticello earlier this week in Montpelier, and then being here on the Freedom Trail and at, at the Old South Meeting House and the Old uh, um, State House, uh, I think we have a great opportunity now to re-engage the public in the, the founding stories of our country. And, I, and you're doing such a great job here at this site and at the other sites we've mentioned. So I think historical literacy is on the rise. I wouldn't say that it's a revolution, but I think there's a movement now in this country to understand the value and importance and relevance 
of, of our national experience. Second reason I wrote uh, the book was to promote heritage tourism. Uh, as, as David said, there's nothing like experiencing history firsthand. The authenticity of this room. You can take a picture of this room. You can put it on the, on the internet. You can take a picture of the old uh, state house. Um, but there's nothing like being at the real place. And ironically, when you're at that real place, it stirs your imagination. It encourages you to use your imagination, to fill in the gaps of what happened at these different places. Um, and it's also worthwhile to, to remember that every one of these historic sites, something new is happening all the time. It's important to rediscover uh, many of these historic places. If you have not been to Gettysburg in many years, there's a wonderful new museum and education center, the same uh, for Monticello and for Mount Pelier. Um, and, and when you come to uh, Boston and you're on the Freedom Trail, just in the last several years, there's a whole new experience of, of costumed guides that take you uh, through around the, the uh, various sites of the Freedom Trail. All of that's new. So the presentation of history is changing all the time at these historic sites. So I, I wrote the book to promote uh, heritage tourism. And finally, I was interested in recognizing the, the importance of historic preservation and um, to honor the visionaries and some of the contemporaries who are so, who are so involved in preserving our historic places. This is the centennial year of the National Park Service, and uh, more than half of the sites that I write about in my book uh, are units of the National Park System. And um, the people, the men and women who work at these, at these sites, at the national parks, at the museums, are true patriots in the best sense of the word, uh, because they really care about uh, preserving American history and sharing what they know. And there's one quote that, that for me is very meaningful uh, in the essay that I wrote about uh, Grand Central Terminal in New York City. And it comes from Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis when she was an advocate uh, for preserving Grand Central Terminal in the 1970s. And many of you remember that, that that was not an easy struggle because there was great pressure to build a skyscraper on top of Grand Central Terminal that would totally have compromised the integrity and maybe even the structural integrity of that, uh, of that landmark. And Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis wrote, uh, is it not cruel to let our city die by degrees, stripped of all her history and beauty to inspire our children? If our children are not inspired by the past of our city, where will they find the strength to fight for her future? If children are not inspired by the past, where will they find the strength to fight for her future? So I think the, the third reason I wrote the book was to pay tribute to the people who had the foresight to um, preserve our history. And as David said, people make history. History is not inevitable. It's not inevitable that the American Revolution occurred when it did. It was people behind that, that, uh, that, 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 those events. It's not inevitable that um, Harriet Beecher Stowe came to write uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which I write about in, in the book. Uh, she, she made that happen. She made that contribution uh, to raising the awareness of the evils of slavery. So history is not uh, inevitable. Historic preservation is not inevitable. Now, selecting the sites for this book, and it's interesting, as I've talked about the book in many locations around the country, more people are, are asking me about what I didn't include than what I did include. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. But I had four criteria in mind. I, wanted, I selected sites from every time period, uh, from the pre-colonial period to the, to the present day. And so the sites are listed <clears throat> in the book roughly in chronological order. And that's important because uh, some people have asked me whether I listed them in order of importance. And that, I was never going to try to do that. And someone from, uh, from Mesa Verde in, in Colorado, which is one of the first uh, essays I write about, said to me, well, I guess Mesa Verde is more important than the Freedom Trail because uh, we're, we're listed third and the Freedom Trail is listed eighth or ninth. I said, no, 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 they're listed in chronological uh, order. Uh, second criteria was geographical distribution. I selected places that represent every region 
of the country. Uh, the third criteria was public access. Uh, these are places that everyone can visit. Um, some have nominal fees, but uh, all of these places are open and available to the public. And the fourth theme was that, uh, the fourth criteria was that the historic places I described um, are, represent major themes in American history. Now I selected five themes, uh, and the five themes are freedom, war, innovation, diversity, and landscape. Freedom, war, innovation, diversity, and landscape. Fweedle, if you're trying to uh, uh, have a, uh, a way to remember that. So what I want to do uh, in the time we have uh, remaining, and I want to um, uh, reserve some time for questions, is to show you some images of some of the sites represented in 50 great American places. I'm not going to show you 50 sites, so don't, uh, don't worry about that. Um, but they will, they will be, they're organized by the themes that I, that I mentioned, freedom, war, innovation, diversity, and, and landscape. So let, join me on a quick tour of America, uh, at America's hist great historic places. So of course I'm going to start with the Freedom Trail. The story of freedom um, can be told here uh, as well as any place in America. And I think it's, it's a great opportunity coming up now. We're in the decade, the 250th anniversary of many of the, the sites, uh, many of the events that led to the American Revolution. And most of that happened here in Boston. So I think we have a, a great opportunity on the Freedom Trail at the various sites to remind people of the central role of this, of this city and of this region in the story of freedom. Uh, I encourage you to visit Seneca Falls, New York. Seneca Falls was mentioned last week um, um, in the uh, victory speech that Hillary Cl uh, Clinton delivered. Um, the National Park Service uh, manages this uh, wonderful historic site. Uh, the uh, building on your, on your left is the Wesleyan Chapel where uh, 300 people gathered in the heat of uh, July uh, 1848 and uh, signed what, was, what they called the Declaration of Sentiments, which included a provision uh, that women would have the right to vote. Now that right was not extended on a federal level, on the national level, until 1919, until the 19th Amendment was adopted. But those women, uh, and the story I like the best about the, the Women's Rights Convention, and, and the building on your left, by the way, is the, the home of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was one of the major organizers of the Women's Rights Convention. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott and some of their colleagues met in early July 1848, and they said, and these, they were mostly abolitionists and, and reform, uh, had, were leading involved in many reform movements, but they said, we need to have a convention in Seneca Falls this month to, uh, to advocate the rights of women. And on three weeks notice, they organized a convention. Now, how many of you have organized a conference and tried to get 300 people to come? You announce it a year ahead of time. Without a fax machine, without the internet, without telephones, they announced the conference and 300 people came and 150 of them, men and women, signed the Declaration of Sentiments. Very important site uh, on the story of freedom. Ebenezer Baptist Church and the Martin Luther King Home in Atlanta, another national park uh, site uh, and a, a very important site for understanding not only the role of, of Martin Luther King, but the whole civil rights movement and the, and the uh, story of freedom that it represents. Uh, the National Park Service has renovated at, at Ebenezer Baptist Church, so now you can co go into the church and hear uh, recordings of Dr. King delivering sermons in that church. And then at the, at the birth home on your right, uh, you can see the, the bedroom, the very humble bedroom where Martin Luther King was born. And one of the stories that I think is, is interesting is that when Martin Luther King was, was born, his name was Michael King Jr. How many people know that? He, his father was Michael King Sr., and he was a pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And Michael King Sr., in the early 1930s, uh, visited Germany with uh, several other ministers. 
and he became very interested in the story of Martin Luther and the uh, Protestant Reformation and the rebellion against the authority of the, of the Catholic Church. And he came back and, and changed his name to Martin Luther King. And he changed his son's name to Martin Luther King Jr. Well, you learn about this and much more visiting uh, the King home at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. Now, some sites related to war. Um, in New Yorktown, uh, the, the cl climatic uh, battle of the American Revolution uh, and, and, and an important uh, reminder of the alliance between the French and Americans that led to the victory over the British in uh, October 1781. That story is told at, at Yorktown. And in my, in my essay about Yorktown, I, I, I uh, include uh, information about Jamestown and Colonial Williamsburg and Fort Monroe and the whole extraordinary um, um, array of historic sites in the Virginia Peninsula and how those sites shaped our early American history and, our, uh, and the Civil War period. And even into the 20th century, Colonial Williamsburg representing one of the uh, most important efforts in historic preservation in this country and in, in any country. Um, so uh, visiting Yorktown, you have an opportunity to visit these other uh, wonderful historic places as well. The Peace Memorial at Gettysburg. I've visited Gettysburg Battlefield probably more than any of the other sites uh, in the book, except for the Brooklyn Bridge, David. I've been to the Brooklyn Bridge m more times. But Gettysburg, uh, in addition to the battlefields and in addition to the historic houses that are open to the public and the museum, uh, the memorial landscape at Gettysburg is stunning. There are more than 1,300 memorials. And the Peace Memorial is of particular interest to me because Franklin Roosevelt in 1938, on the, on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the um, Battle of Gettysburg, dedicated this memorial. And a peace memorial dedicated in 1938, just on the eve of World War II, I think was, is particularly interesting to me and a particularly uh, um, poignant moment when the world was about to uh, enter into a, a another major uh, and catastrophic uh, conflict. This peace memorial uh, stands to uh, a better, a, a better, uh, and a more hopeful, uh, more hopeful future. I have an essay about the Indian Wars in uh, um, the mid uh, 19th century, following uh, following uh, the, our Civil War. Uh, on the left is the uh, cemetery at Little Bighorn in Montana, and on the right is the um, a very humble uh, memorial. Um, maintained by a local group at, uh, in, uh, at the, uh, de uh, dedicated to the massacre at Wounded Knee in South, in South Dakota. The Indian Wars is not a happy chapter in our nation's history, but I included uh, several essays on places that are, um, are essential, and that's why I, uh, the subtitle of the book is called Essential Places, to understand how much American history has uh, how much we have, how many challenges we have faced, uh, how much we have overcome, the barriers we have overcome to, uh, toward this uh, uh, achieving uh, our, our, uh, who we are as Americans uh, today. The uh, memorial at uh, uh, Pearl Harbor in uh, Honolulu is uh, another uh, example in the story of war. And we will be observing uh, in December the 75th uh, anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. When I was growing up, we, we learned about Pearl Harbor Day. I'm not sure if people think about Pearl Harbor Day today. I hope that there will be some recognition of the importance of, of, that, of how that, that war shaped and changed American history. And um, I think we have an opportunity to teach about uh, World War II uh, all over uh, by, by um, uh, observing what, what occurred at Pearl Harbor and the aftermath of, of, um, of that attack uh, on America. Uh, one of my favorite um, documents is the original uh, draft of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's speech uh, to Congress on December 8th. And the, uh, the, the speech, the original speech is on display at, at Hyde Park at the Roosevelt Library, in which he wrote, well, the original speech said December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in world history 
And you can see that Roosevelt scratched it out and wrote infamy above world history, and that's how we remember uh, that speech today. Now, innovation. Um, I'll show you a few examples uh, that I think are, are interesting. The uh, Slater Mill, not far from here in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, the first textile mill uh, in uh, the country is now a museum, a wonderful uh, example of uh, early power technology, water-powered technology. They do a terrific job there at Slater Mill explaining uh, textile manufacturing and explaining the, the relevance uh, and the context of the, of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Slater Mill um, dates, by the way, from the early 1790s, and so you can get a sense of the important um, uh, development of the textile industry that, that uh, really changed uh, New England and changed America. The Montclair shops in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, on July 4th, 1828, John Quincy Adams dedicated the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal outside of uh, Washington, D.C. And on that, on that same day, July 4th, 1828, the uh, founders of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad set uh, the first cornerstone of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. So this is a great example of history is not inevitable. They didn't, they didn't know whether the railroad or the canal would be the, the, the technology that would get the transportation technology that would bring, uh, open up the, uh, the Midwest of the United States. It turned out that the railroad was the shaping technology and was the winner over canals, but railroads changed America maybe more than any other technology, uh, certainly in the 19th century, and they continue to, to uh, make a, a major contribution uh, to America today. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum in Baltimore is one of the best railroad collections in the world, and I encourage you to, uh, to visit this, uh, this uh, historic site and, and this museum. Now, of course, the Wright Brothers uh, Memorial, David, I wouldn't leave this out uh, of, my, of my review. The Wright Brothers truly are uh, American originals. There's no other way to describe them. I only devote three or four pages in my book uh, to the Wright Brothers. You can read much more about it in David's wonderful book uh, about the Wright Brothers. Uh, they, their contributions to, uh, to technology, to aviation technology, but their example of their perseverance and their intelligence and their courage, their, their physical courage, uh, is, is, a, is a great story and a great American story. And then I have an essay about Silicon Valley and the electronics revolution, and the, di the digital revolution. This is uh, the Computer History Museum in, in uh, Mountain View, uh, California. You can drive around Silicon Valley and see the garages of Hewlett Packard where Hewlett Packard started and uh, the Google garage and the Apple garage where uh, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs uh, first uh, developed their computers. But you can also visit this museum, the Computer History Museum, which is located in a building that was a, a, a tech, part of the tech, uh, a, a technology company, uh, Silicon Graphics which did not survive, and it's a good artifact of the fact that uh, many technology companies do not survive, uh, but it's a wonderful museum and a great way to explore the, the history of the, uh, of the digital revolution that's, that's changed so much of the 21st century. Now, diversity. I mentioned Mesa Verde, Colorado. The, uh, um, the cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde are uh, not to be missed and the National Park Service does an amazing job of preserving these uh, wonderful um, um, examples of a civilization that thrived in the, in the 11th and 12th and 13th centuries. And um, uh, it, it reminds us that we think of the American Indians as nomadic uh, uh, tribes, but in fact, they established very sophisticated civilizations and, uh, and cities and, and uh, complexes that without advanced technology, uh, we can uh, enjoy and see today. And um, a, a great e example of, our, of, our, of the story of diversity. In um, Arizona, uh, south of Tucson, is Mission San Javier. How many of you ever, how many have ever, ever visited? Would you agree that's one of the 50 great American places, one of the 
uh, last of the Spanish missions, um, this, uh, this mission, this, this site, uh, is a good example of the Spanish presence in the United States. Uh, we think of American history as going from east to west, but in fact, there were at least three beginnings of American history. There was Jamestown uh, in 1607, there was Quebec in 1608, there was uh, Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, where Catherine and I met, uh, not in 1609, but, but uh, <laughs> 1609 is when uh, uh, Santa Fe was established. So there were three American beginnings 400 years ago. In the late 18th century, Mission St. Javier was constructed. I say constructed instead of completed because you can see that the, uh, one of the bell towers was never completed. The interior of this building is, a, is stunning. Uh, Hand-carved uh, statues of the Virgin Mary, of St. Francis, of, of, the other, of many other saints, of um, ordinary uh, American Indians. And uh, this is uh, still maintained as part of the Santa Fe Diocese. Um, and maintained uh, and preserved today and is open uh, to the public. New Harmony, Indiana. This is the labyrinth at uh, New Harmony. New Harmony was the site of two utopian communities. Uh, one established by the Harmonist Society. They had started out in Pennsylvania, in Harmony, Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh, uh, in the early 19th century. Um, they were a, a, a very successful communal society, and they, uh, after a, a, a period of time uh, in Pennsylvania, moved to Indiana and reestablished this utopian society um, that was also economically very viable and very successful. Uh, their only uh, challenge was th that they were a celibate society, so they, d they did not have a succession plan, and so they, um, they died out eventually in the 19th, at the end of the 19th century. But for a good part of the 19th century, they were a phenomenally successful uh, utopian society, perhaps the most su successful in American history. Uh, after 10 years in Indiana, they sold their, pro their Indiana holdings and moved back to Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh, in what is now Ambridge, Pennsylvania. But they are, um, uh, they, and that, that, they called that town economy. Their first town they called Harmony then New Harmony, and then the third settlement was called Economy. And I love the na those names, because it really says what they were all about. Uh, they sold their property to another utopian society founded by a uh, textile uh, manufacturer, a textile entrepreneur, Robert Owen. And he established a utopian society in New Harmony that was not s successful. After about three years, uh, the, the uh, society folded. But most of the buildings, many of the buildings, have either been restored or preserved. And this labyrinth uh, was restored in the 1930s, and it's an illustration of the harmonist philosophy. They believed that we needed to be in harmony with nature. And at the, at the center of this labyrinth is a grotto, and the exterior of the grotto is rough on the outside, and the interior is smooth. And that reflected their philosophy about human nature. So uh, New Harmony, Indiana is, is a well-preserved um, town illustrating not only the, the two utopias of the um, early 19th century, but also the efforts to preserve um, um, that history uh, in the 20th century. There's a church designed by Philip Johnson. There's a uh, Athenaeum, a meeting house designed by Richard Meyer. There's a garden de uh, d devoted or dedicated to Paul Tillich. It's well worth uh, a visit to New Harmony, uh, Indiana. The Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee is another example of America's diverse cultural tr traditions. And there's a woman behind this story. Uh, Laura Neff was her name. She was the manager of the Ryman Auditorium, which started out as a church in the late 1890s and is, is known as the mother church of country music. Well, by the time Laura Neff was the manager of the Ryman Auditorium, she was booking uh, a number of different uh, entertainment um, um, uh, examples, a variety of, entertainer, of entertainers, and she, uh, in the 1940s, um, uh, uh, developed a contract or signed a contract with the Grand Old Opry, uh, and that radio show, the Grand Old Opry, was broadcast from Ryman Auditorium starting in the 1940s all the way through to the 1970s, 
and then it was closed, but was restored and reopened in the 1990s, and now there are concerts and performances of all different kinds of music. But the Ryman Auditorium plays a central role in the, in the uh, emergence and the transformation of Nashville into a music city. Now I'll close with a few images of uh, sites that relate to the, the landscape. The first national park in this country, 1872, is Yellowstone National Park. And it predates the uh, um, establishment of the National Park Service by, um, let's see, 28, 16, somebody help me, more than 40 years. Um, the, the, the idea of national parks was an American idea. And um, there are many historic structures uh, in addition to the uh, amazing scenic and natural wonders of, of Yellowstone that uh, you can enjoy. And in this centennial year of the National Park Service, I certainly encourage you to make that journey. The Presidio in San Francisco is another example of the story of how landscape uh, shapes American history. When John Fremont, the um, uh, later, uh, in, in 1856, John Fremont was the first Republican nominee for president, but 10 years before that time, he was an officer in the US Army, and he saw the entrance to San Francisco Bay, and he said, I'm going to call this, era, this spot Chrysopoli, which in Greek means Golden Gate. And he said, this, this place will be as important to North America as the Golden Horn is to Constantinople. And he was right, uh, because the city of San Francisco and the um, uh, various, uh, and the, the, the development of that part of, of our country has been such, a, such an important part of American history. Today, you can visit the Presidio and, and uh, where the army had occupied this place from the 1840s to uh, the 1990s. Uh, in the last 20 years, the Presidio has been transformed from an army post to part of the National Park uh, system. And in the foreground, uh, you see people um, enjoying a day at Chrissy Field, which was the birthplace of uh, West Coast aviation. Uh, you see the Golden Gate Bridge. And what I particularly like about this image is that on the south end of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge, you see this arch. And that arch is not on the northern end of the bridge. The reason for the arch is to preserve Fort Point, which was a Civil War fort uh, built uh, just before the Civil War. And as they were designing the bridge, uh, someone had the idea uh, that historic preservation was important in the 1930s. And they said, we have to preserve Fort Point. And so they changed the design of the Golden Gate Bridge. Willa Cather uh, is one of my heroes, and I know one of David McCullough's heroes. Um, Willa Cather grew up, um, for, uh, spent most of her youth in Red Cloud, Nebraska, and you can visit uh, the Willa Cather home, which you see on the right, uh, and many of the sites that she writes about. And she wrote about the Great Prairie of America and the immigrants who settled that, that, uh, that uh, area and changed the landscape of America. But also she writes about how the landscape changed them. And there is a 600-acre park, a memorial park just outside of Red Cloud, of never-been-plowed prairie that has been, been preserved by the Willa Cather Foundation. So another example of the story of, of landscape. And finally, I want to uh, close with a man-made landscape, which is the National Mall in Washington, D.C., uh, where I worked for many years at the Smithsonian, and, and in which uh, visitors from all over the world can make a connection with uh, the American experience. It's on the National Mall that we uh, pay tribute to some of the great leaders of, of our country. We have some of the most uh, outstanding museum collections. Um, this is the seat of government, the Capitol, the White House, Supreme Court, uh, the Library of Congress, the uh, National Archives are all there. Uh, it's a place of American identity and a place of public memory. And so the first essay in this book is uh, about the National Mall, the front the front porch of American democracy. And it is a living landscape, a living historical landscape. Uh, people come there today to uh, protest, to celebrate American democracy, to commemorate uh, important events. 
to inaugurate uh, new presidents. So um, I, I think this is an appropriate way to, uh, to close this, uh, my remarks and open it up for questions. But um, thank you very much for your attention and for uh, your interest in 50 great American places. Thank you. that you mentioned the Smithsonian because one of my favorite little exhibits in that is the gunboat Philadelphia, which is the original totally preserved gunboat from the revolution from Lake Champlain. And just as an aside, I thought I'd mention that if you go to the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, I believe, you can actually see a video of a second gunboat that is still preserved in the water due to the cold temperatures. But uh, the Smithsonian, the America's Attic, I was glad that you mentioned it because it's such a great spot to see. Yes. Well, I'm, thank you for mentioning that. And, and I've been doing some work recently at Fort Ticonderoga uh, in the Adirondacks. And uh, what many people forget is that Benedict Arnold, who assembled the fleet that uh, fought uh, the, at the Battle of Alcor Island uh, uh, in uh, 1776, um, was on our side for many years uh, before he uh, went to the other side and was a hero of the American Revolution and could have been um, one of the great heroes uh, of the American Revolution. And the gunboat Philadelphia that you describe is the oldest naval vessel uh, in, uh, that's been preserved in America. So thank you for mentioning that. Thank you. Well, I was interested in your interest in reaching young people. Um, and I wondered whether you've had a chance to present in front of uh, groups of younger people uh, or wonder what kind of questions are they asking? Are they engaged? Or have you given up on all of them? <laughs> no, no, and I'm going, to, I'm going to, yes, I have met a number of younger people and um, uh, who have who've come to several of the lectures that I've given about, uh, about the book. Uh, I'm very encouraged by the interest that the young people have in in putting the book uh, in their knapsack and uh, getting on the road. Um, I'm going to embarrass her now, but my assistant, Hannah Saloyo, is here, and she uh, told me that she uh, knows every word to every song in the in musical Hamilton, uh, but she even has said she's gonna read the book, which is even better. Um, but I think uh, Hannah and her friends and uh, the generation, I guess we call the millennials, have a very strong interest in history. And I'm very encouraged, I don't know, David, if you see this, uh, where you traveled around, around the country, I think it's, uh, it's important that we not take for granted that they know, that, that younger people know some of these stories, but we should also, th there's a way to make these uh, stories come alive. And I, I'm very encouraged by, uh, by what I see in here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for coming. Are any of the, uh the places in your book commemorating uh, the sites of American shameful behavior, or is every part of American history nice? Um, the question about commemorating shameful behavior, well, I did, I did um, the, the Indian Wars, I think, is an uh, example of places that um, are, are tragedies, places of tragedy. Um, I also have an essay about the, uh, the civil rights movement, the Central High School in uh, in Little Rock, uh, Arkansas, which is a national park uh, site today. Uh, the Minidoka uh, internment camp in uh, Idaho is another uh, place that I, that I write about. The Witch Trial uh, Memorial, uh, not far from here in Salem, is a, is a story that I think uh, is an unhappy story that, that needs to be told. So those are some that, that come to mind. But it's, it's a good question, and I've been asked that question. And, and the idea of including places of, uh, that, uh, that, that um, reveal a darker uh, part of our history, I think are essential to understanding who we are as Americans. And the nice thing about, I think, American history and about being a historian in America, in America is that we can argue about our history and we can uh, debate. Uh, I was once speaking in Moscow at a, uh, a conference of a museum conference, and a young woman stood up, and the uh, translation was not, uh, um, it was sequential, so I was waiting for the translation. She made about a two or three minute speech, and she, uh, and I, I couldn't imagine what she was, and she was quite agitated and quite uh, worked up, and I wasn't sure exactly what she was saying, and 
the translator said, she's asking, what do you do about historical falsification? That was it. And that was a real concern to her. So I think we have the opportunity to debate uh, in uh, this country what is, as you said, shameful history, and then tr try to learn from it. Try to learn from it. Yes. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, there are a lot of great historic places that are also suffering from lack of funding um, and having difficulty with preservation. And so I was wondering if you could um, just speak to how we sustain our historic places going into the future. Well, the question of how do we sustain um, historic places uh, in the future, one of the other unique um, characteristics of uh, historical memory and historic preservation in this country is that that's, it requires so much private enterprise. And as I've traveled to other countries or meet uh, professionals from other countries, they're amazed at the uh, level of private sector involvement. And, and Carl and I have talked about this, and I've talked about it with uh, my colleagues on, on the Freedom Trail. Um, and we, we met earlier some of the people who volunteer their time to preserve uh, and to, to serve on the boards of these, of these organizations. I'm, I'm not that optimistic about public support for history in the future. And I think we have to be very strategic and targeted as we try to make our case for, uh, for public support. I am much more optimistic about private support for history. I think that, that there is a growing interest in all generations and across the country that these places are important, that we're going to figure out ways to preserve them. Uh, I'm involved in a number of projects around the country that where, where private local leadership is, is stepping forward. Uh, the public sector is following behind, unfortunately, uh, and I'm, I, I just think, to be very candid, I'm not optimistic about public support, uh, and I, notwithstanding the great work that the National Park Service does, I think the people from the National Park Service would also tell you how, how much of a struggle it is and challenge it is to, um, to, to sustain uh, the great uh, uh, historic sites that we have in this country. But I'm very optimistic about private uh, enterprise and private uh, support. Well, you've been a wonderful audience. I guess I will uh, uh, meet more of you later um, and sign some books, but uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to join you this evening, and, th and thanks for this, this day with you. Thank you. Dear Miss America, I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men weren't, in fact, created equal. I'm tired of being lied to, but perhaps I'm most angry that Uncle Sim told me Racism is natural, that white is right, that it gives the white man privileges to leave us red and blue. This is America, he told me. Took me years to figure out that none of this is true. See, in the 17th century, the rich elite feared defeat. They smelled rebellion brewing, peeped poor white and black collaboration looming. White indentured servants and black slaves fighting for the same purpose till they gave the poor white man just a little more service, just a little more devotion, and that poor man class consciousness began eroding. Soon enough, the black man was left down and out, bonded in chains, and ever since nothing has been the same, the whole game was changed. The elite successfully constructed a system of exclusion. Fast forward to 2016, and let me tell you, life ain't what it seems. Just because we have a black man as president doesn't mean we live in a post-racial society. It's time to relearn American history because historical ignorance is no excuse to condone injustice and remain indifferent. I'll admit, times feel different, but are they?